Uh, good afternoon, uh, Lee Harris, uh, Shelby County Mayor. Uh, pleased to be here on behalf of the Joint Task Force, uh, where we are working on a variety of programs in order to uh, help the careful and responsible, safe economic recovery uh, in our community. Uh, many of those programs are city, county funded. In addition, I should shout out the state because the state have been very supportive in some of our programs. Today, I just want to flag um, the status of a couple of programs. They're programs that we have talked about before, and they are programs that are funded by the county's share of CARES funding. Uh, the first program I want to flag is the Share the Tab program. Uh, this is the program to support the limited uh, service restaurants or bars in Shelby County. There are 42 uh, of those uh, licensed limited service restaurants in Shelby County. Uh, these small businesses have been affected by COVID and have been affected by COVID more than most. The Share of the Tab program is a program put together by our office and the Shelby County Commission to set aside about uh, nearly a half a million dollars uh, to support those businesses through grants of about $10,000 per limited service restaurant or bar. Uh, the grants of $10,000 uh, we announced, I think, a week ago, uh, not very long ago, and the um, interest is great so far. We've already noticed about 30 businesses, 30 limited service restaurants, that they will receive the full award of $10,000. Uh, that means we still have some funding left in that program, and so you can see how to apply if you are a limited service restaurant or if you want more information because you are another kind of restaurant that feels like you might be eligible. So again, in order to apply or to get more information as a restaurant about eligibility, we would uh, point you to the website COVID-19 Shelby County TN.gov. In addition, we've seen really great interest in our program to support close contact businesses. This program, of course, is referred to as our beautiful comeback, since the vast majority of close contact businesses are barber shops, beauty shops, nail salon businesses. The program uh, in its uh, former iteration would award $2,000 grants to these businesses because of the permanent lost revenue, and in addition, because these businesses have to take on extra and heightened precautions in order to safely have close contact with their clientele. We have already had hundreds of owners of close contact businesses apply for an award and get notice of an award. And so, so far in this program, we've noticed awards or distributed awards totaling around $600,000. The total amount in this program, our beautiful comeback, is $1 million, and so we still have money left in the program. Since the rollout of this program, we've seen really great interest in the industry, and so today we have formally expanded the program and expanded eligibility for our beautiful comeback. Under the expanded program, all licensed cosmetologists and barbers and other close contact professionals are eligible to apply. Again, all licensed stylists will be eligible to apply for an award under the new expanded program. As you can see from the slide, the award for those individual beauty professionals is $500. And this award is used to help offset the relatively unique hardship, hardships that the beauty professionals have faced during COVID. Uh, that is to say these uh, beauty professionals have faced permanent loss of their revenue and we all expect them to reopen and to um, um, reestablish their businesses with heightened safety precautions. And we need these businesses to open, sure, but we need these businesses, since they are in close contact with many customers during the day, to fo really follow public health guidance. Additionally, uh, the close contact businesses, uh, the owners, are still eligible for the $2,000 grant award under the basic program. As I mentioned last week, we've also worked with the health department to continue outreach to this industry, not just about the awards uh, that are related to the COVID hardships, but to spread the message around safe practices at close contact businesses. The new health department street team uh, is maybe coming to a barber shop or a beauty shop near you soon. Uh, so we know there's a lot going on, uh, and we know that we're going to have to do a lot more if we're going to make it to the other side of this pandemic, and we will do more. We have to do more. So with that, I would invite to the podium the director of our health department, Alisa Househalter. Thanks. Uh, 
Thank you, Mayor Harrison. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll give a few data updates and then talk specifically about the areas that we'll continue to focus on as a health department. Then I'll turn it over to Dr. Randolph for some additional comments around the health directive and public health guidance. As of this morning, we have 31,462 cases. That's an increase of just 71 from yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, we've had one, uh, 457 deaths, um, which is 1.5% of the population. That's remained steady. It'll go between 1.4 and 1.5%. Our median age, which means um, the age at which half of the cases are above or below that age, uh, so the median uh, age of death is 73. It's really important to point that out because I think there's a perception that um, just the elderly are impacted, but we have had deaths ranging from as young as 13 to as um, old as 100. So we do know that COVID can still impact the younger population, particularly um, those with chronic illnesses. So it's important to consider that. Our overall trends are in a positive direction. I think that's really important. Uh, we were all concerned about the possibility of increases post Labor Day, and we did see a slight increase, but that is um, really trended back down. So we know that our 14 day trend is on a downward trend. We know that our average number of new cases per day over the past week is about 128, which is positive, and our reproductive rate has gone back under one. Uh, the important thing is that we don't want to become complacent. Uh, we are in a very good place currently, but we want to continue in a positive trend, in part to assure that, uh, one, we can all get back to work, but that children can get back to school. And it's going to be critical that we continue to move forward in a positive way so that we can get children back into the classroom and back to school. So there are some key areas that we'll focus on, and I want to highlight those and then give some additional updates. We will continue to work on communications, uh, particularly outreach to communities that we know either are not getting tested as much as other communities or where we potentially see an increase in the number of cases or increase uh, risk of transmission. We really have to focus very heavily right now on testing and what we call case finding in public health, but identifying those new cases of COVID and quickly getting them isolated then identifying their contacts quickly uh, through the contact tracing process and getting those individuals quarantined as quickly as possible. That's a containment strategy that we've used throughout, but our numbers are small enough now that if we move very quickly on containment, we can reduce transmission and that's gonna be critical. But the other area that we need to focus heavily is on enforcement. We do know over this past weekend, uh, we received a total of nine complaints on facilities that were not adherent to the health directive. And the things that were reported to us were um, it, not masking or insufficient masking, not social distancing, as well as staying open beyond the 10 o'clock hour, which is when restaurants, both full service and limited services, restaurants are expected to uh, close. And we know that some of those are staying open. Of those nine, two were um, facilities that we re previously received reports on, and one of those I've actually received multiple reports. So it's really important that the public report to us when there are facilities that are non-compliant so that we can focus very specifically on those facilities and not more broadly on similar facilities. And then also we're asking particularly those who are restaurant owners or limited service restaurant owners that you review the health directive and comply with the directive. Or if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll provide education and technical assistance. Unfortunately, we will have to move to a place that if there's ongoing non-compliance that we would have to close the facility or work closely with the ABC board to potentially have a liquor license revoked. So it's critical, we want people to do well economically, but um, that can happen and still have compliance with the health directive. Some questions that we've been receiving recently, so there's been a lot in the national news about the test kits that will be issued to each state. We do anticipate that Tennessee will receive a shipment of test kits the Tennessee Department of Health then will divide those kits up across the state and uh, allow us to use those test kits, particularly for getting children back to school. 
So while many people want answers, we really have to await for um, the total number of test kits that will come into the state, look at how they'll be distributed, and then how do we strategically deploy those to assure that we can get children back to school as quickly as possible. So I'm gonna pause there and turn it over to Dr. Randolph and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Dr. House Halter, Mayor Harris. Greetings, citizens of Shelby County. I'm Dr. Bruce Randolph, the health officer, Shelby County Health Department. I'd like to just highlight a couple of things uh, today, and then we will open things up for questions. One thing I want to just remind uh, everyone to adhere to the safety measures outlined in the health directive number 12. It's very important that we all, whether you're individual, whether you are a business or a service, that we adhere to the safety measures that uh, we uh, have outlined. Specifically, I want to just mention uh, to the county facilities that they're also uh, required to adhere to the safety measures outlined. Uh, there's effort uh, to uh, address the crowded issues there at the uh, Criminal Justice Center uh, where the courts are there uh, 201 Poplar. We have made efforts to address that and, and um, they appear to be um, successful. We are assessing that. But my appeal is actually to the citizens if you uh, summoned, uh, you have some um, warrant or something that requires you to appear in court. We encourage you to come on the date and time that's outlined on your uh, warrant uh, and to come and leave when done and not just hang around you can help us tremendously in terms of avoiding the crowds that uh, tend to gather sometimes outside waiting to get in as well as there in the halls. The other thing I want to mention is we well know that voting is uh, coming upon us. Early voting sites have been identified and we just want to encourage and reinforce the fact that those locations must also adhere to the safety measures uh, outlined in the health directive. And so we encourage the uh, election commission to ensure that the early voting sites that you have identified that they are indeed safe and afford uh, the uh, opportunity for everyone to be able to exercise their constitutional right to vote without the fear of being infected with the COVID-19 virus. I uh, just want to reiterate what Dr. House Halter stated about limited service restaurants. You must do what's right. We are allowing an opportunity to uh, allow you to open, to operate, uh, but it must be within the safety measures that uh, apply to everyone. And we are indeed partnering with the Alcohol Beverage Commission, and they uh, have agreed that if uh, you are found to be in violation of the health directive, that that would be grounds to have your liquor license uh, terminated. And we all know that without a liquor license, many of you would not have a business because that's very crucial. So we're encouraging you and asking you to adhere with the, the directives, do what's right, let's do right so we can do more. The last thing I wanna just say to the citizens and remind everyone that simply because things are open doesn't necessarily mean you ought to go. Uh, you ought to visit or participate. You must assess your own risk based on your personal medical history and know what um, things you ought to uh, be around and what you should not, crowds you should avoid, et cetera. And uh, 
also uh, reminding everyone that because things are legally permissible, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's medically advisable. So use your best judgment in deciding uh, what you will engage in and what you will not. With that, I will stop and entertain any questions that you may have. April Thompson, WREG. April Thompson, WREG. Go to Brad Broders with Local 24. Good afternoon. Uh, just going back to the uh, with the lower with the good trends going in the right directions. Has this impacted your belief in a second surge or what's the message to the public like seeing all these good trends and the potential of uh, swinging in the other direction? Well, my message to the public is we headed in a good direction. Let's continue doing what we're doing to get there. Now is not the time to revert back to old habits. Things won't return back to the way they used to be. The measures that we have in place will be with us for a while, and we need to be consistent and persistent and continue down the path that we're traveling so that the numbers can even get better. Okay. Brad, just to add to that briefly, based on the current calculations, particularly with the positivity rate less than one, we anticipate that there could be a surge in the spring of next year, and that would be over 300 hospitalizations a day. What's important to note about that is that that's a very small number um, compared to our original calculations. So as pointed out by Dr. Randolph, if we continue to move in this direction, that really is that uh, flattening of the epi curve that everyone's talked about so that we won't um, potentially have a surge that we were all really concerned about in the beginning, uh, in part because we were seeing what was happening in New York, New Jersey, and other states and cities that had significant surges. So right now we're looking at March as a potential, but if we continue to bring those down, we can avoid a surge that really overwhelms our systems in any way. And did you have a follow-up? I did, Dr. Househalter. Just to, do, do you anticipate the health department in coordination with city and county code enforcement needing to up their enforcement, any changes of enforcement with these limited service restaurants now reopening? So that's a really great question. Uh, we've actually been working very closely, not just with the city, but also with the sheriff's office and other municipalities to one, identify places where we needed to first engage, then educate, and then do enforcement. What we will do is continue to explore what all um, levers we have that we can use to help a business come into compliance. So the example really is what was pointed out by working with the um, ABC board. We're able to potentially focus on licensure, which is obviously a higher level um, infraction than just closing a place for a day or two days. So we'll continue to explore. We'll continue to evolve. What I do want to point out is we have had a lot lot of the public as well as employees reach out to the health department to identify when there's non-compliance. So what that says to us is that um, everyone in the community wants to move forward and wants people to be responsible. And so we're going to continue to rely on those reports and explore all the options that, that we have. We'll go back to April Thompson with WREG. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask um, about the U of M. I know a couple of weeks ago you were talking about what you all were seeing there. Can you give an update on that? And I do have a follow-up. Sure, I'm going to ask, do you want to give an update on U of M? Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Randolph because he's been more involved with that investigation than I have. Well, as you all may be aware that um, a couple of games have been postponed uh, because of um, cases of uh, folk in quarantine. It's my understanding that they have recovered, improved, and the anticipation is that the UM will be resuming the football. Um, we're continuing to work closely uh, with uh, the uh, athletic department, and as 
uh, numbers improve, we anticipate even making some changes uh, in our policies relates to attendance. Okay. Um, my other question was related to the flu season coming up, and um, I think I directed some questions to Dr. Hausalter um, yesterday for a story we were doing. But um, what impact do you think um, the flu season is going to have on this COVID spread, and what are you um, encouraging people to do as far as the flu shot, especially since some places around the country have been said to have a shortage? Well, we're certainly encouraging everyone to get your flu shot and get it early. Uh, certainly that will help uh, in terms of preventing the spread of the flu. There's uh, two potential outcomes that we could be uh, dealing with. One is that the, uh, due to the safety measures that we are practicing to avoid the spread of COVID, that is wear the facial uh, mask, uh, maintaining the six feet separation, washing of your hands, et cetera, that those measures may also decrease the spread of uh, influenza. And our hope is that, that is that similar to what has been reported in some other parts of the world, that the influenza outbreak hadn't been as severe as uh, anticipated and largely attributed to because the same measures are beneficial in preventing influenza as it is COVID-19. The other flip side of that is that uh, due to the fact that people are inside more due to the cold weather, uh, ventilation in homes aren't as uh, near as what ventilation outside is, uh, and that people are, tend to be closer to each other, there's that risk of uh, increased uh, spread of transmission. Again, that is why it is very, very important that we wear our face covering, that we, whenever we can, as much as we can, practice the social distancing and washing of the hands and disinfecting these measures all will be very crucial coming uh, this uh, fall and winter when we have on top of COVID uh, flu. Do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Kendall Downing, WMC. Hey everyone, good afternoon. Uh, first uh, question is for Director Househalter. I was wondering, you mentioned the rapid test would be used uh, in the school setting. I was wondering if you could kind of explain how that would work. And I know that you know more will be known once we have an idea of how many uh, we would get, but just explain how, how those tests would be useful in that setting. And then I have a follow up. Yes, I'm going to make a general comment about testing in certain settings, um, which could include anything from pool testing to rapid testing to the typical nasopharyngeal testing. One thing that we know now is that we really don't have a limit of tests, and we really haven't in Shelby County from the beginning, but nationwide those um, limits are no longer exist, so there is more access to a variety of testing tools. Again, pool testing, uh, that's when uh, 10 tests are run at one time as a batch. That's a good way to do uh, what we would call assurance or surveillance or case finding testing, which I'll talk about more in a minute, um, at a large scale at a limited cost. That's only effective if you have a low positivity rate. Then you can do rapid tests, which allows you to have the answer um, to the test result relatively quickly so that people can be isolated quickly and any contacts quarantined very quickly. And then the traditional nasopharyngeal test, we actually are getting those back in one to three days. So that also allows for fairly timely um, test results to isolate and quarantine individuals. Where that's beneficial and has been beneficial as an example is nursing homes. Nursing homes have been t doing twice a week testing for some time. And what that does allow us to pick up the case quickly and remove them from the work environment or isolate them within the facility to reduce transmission. So you're really containing that spread. And so instead of one case becoming many cases, that one case may become no cases or a very small number of cases. Where that's gonna be valuable in schools is it allows the school system to pick up teachers, 
other employees as well as students who may be positive much more quickly so that they can get isolated and prevent um, the mass quarantining of large numbers of students because uh, potentially a case may have been infectious and around a lot of people over, over many days. So that will allow us, again, be very laser focused in our strategies to reduce transmission and um, also facilitate getting back to the classroom in a safe manner. And you follow up? Yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask a general question. Uh, you, know, you have mentioned uh, the impact of crime on public health here in Memphis. Obviously, working through this pandemic has had effects in, in all different areas. Uh, you know, the city notched a record of homicides. Do you all believe that there is a public health impact on this? And has the pandemic uh, impacted, you know, maybe how the crime is taking place in the city? Thank you. Thank you. So, Actually, looking nationwide, we know that some of the data would indicate changes in a lot of conditions that in public health we view as um, health conditions. So everything from the opioid overdoses have increased. In some communities, suicides have increased. Some homicides have increased. Domestic violence has increased. I recently heard data in a report the other day that our divorce Filings have increased significantly in Shelby County as well. So I do think the impact of the pandemic, everything from the financial stress to the overall emotional stress or fear of what may happen to people being confined in um, smaller spaces has impacted a lot of things that impact our emotional and physical well-being and that can have an impact on crime. What's difficult to do is actually draw a straight line. So it's difficult to say because of COVID, we have had increased overdoses. What we know is that our overdoses were trending up already and that we have more fentanyl on the market. When you have increase in drug trafficking, you may also have consequentially an increase in homicides. So I think we, um, one, have to recognize that there's an impact of COVID, but I think my greater takeaway and the challenge I have in our, to our community broadly and in our community is how do we put the energy that we've put into COVID to solve some of these other root issues that we have historically? We have historically had a high homicide rate um, when we look at the numbers of people who have died from COVID and we look at the same number or potentially over several years, the same number of young people dying of homicide, we have to be willing to step up and do things differently. So my hopes are that um, as we uh, move into marathon mode and kind of get to the end of COVID at some point in the future, that we will collectively come together to address particularly violence in our community, which has a significant impact on um, not only life, but overall well-being for everyone who's, who's impacted. That also has significant economic impact on our community. If we have a national reputation of being a violent community, businesses are less likely to come here. People are less likely to seek jobs here. So um, yes, there is some impact, but uh, I, I really challenge people to move to action and for us to do something collectively to have a healthier community for everyone. Dima Amro, Commercial Appeal. Hi, um, I actually do have a question about the link between the pandemic and the violence. Um, you mentioned that there is an increase in the violence. I wanted to know if there was anything the public health officials could do or maybe the people of Shelby County could do. And I do have a follow up question. So there's a lot we can all do. Um, there's a lot already being done. There's been a lot um, historically that's been done in this community. Uh, it's a very similar statement. We have to stay the course as we begin to address issues that are the root causes of violence in our community. We have to be willing to invest the time and energy really for years to impact an outcome. One of the things that public health can do is to elevate violence as a public health issue. That has not always been the case. Oftentimes violence is viewed as an enforcement issue, but is truly related to other underlying causes, what we call social determinants of health. That's everything from poverty to systemic and historic racism over to um, lack of educational attainment and, and lack of job attainment. So if we address those root causes, we ultimately impact violence. But we also have to focus our efforts on the fallout uh, or the consequences of violence. Uh, those traumatic experiences for children and adults really have lifelong um, impacts. And so being able to address those collectively 
The other thing that we can do is what I did earlier is we need to come together as a community and really have a broad approach to address violence very much like we have with COVID. I think if we come together at a high level and implement policy change and system change and invest our resources appropriately, we can make a difference not only in reducing violence but actually increasing positive outcomes for all people to make sure that they achieve economic stability, they're able to uh, achieve educational outcome and seek meaningful employment and give back to the community in a meaningful way. Okay, and my follow-up question is, you mentioned how there was a slight increase post Labor Day, mm -hmm. but I wanted to know if you thought we were like out of the post Labor Day danger window. Uh, yes. So um, we looked at uh, exactly one incubation period, so that's 14 days, but then we added another five to seven days um, beyond that to really watch closely for hospitalizations that may have resulted uh, relative to Labor Day. And what we saw was we did have that little increase, and then we have gone back down to um, where we were previously. So I think we've gotten through the Labor Day impact, definitely. We are out of time. Are there any closing messages? No, I just um, want to comment that beginning next week, the Joint Task Force will be meeting weekly. So we will reduce the press conferences to once weekly beginning next week. It'll still be on Tuesday. And um, obviously, we're always willing to entertain questions from the media in between. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.